I want to hear you sing or, or hear sung, and uh, we'll we'll uh, hear the ladies as they come and they'll sing for us, and then we'll get our Bibles ready uh, for our message tonight from First Corinthians in chapter eight, and you could turn there, or chapter nine, excuse me, and you could turn there now. But I want you to give a good ear and the message of the song here. you would say, word of God speak, won't you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place, please let me stay. Appreciate a uh, heart to sing and a heart to, uh, to, to be a blessing. Tonight our, our message is in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians 9. And we're dealing with the subject on the cost of ministry. The cost of ministry. What does it take for somebody to truly serve and uh, minister to others? And here Paul addresses this church at Corinth. And in some respect, we could say this is a very um, upfront chapter and that he, he asserts himself, Paul does, as an apostle and one with authority and one that is uh, uh, given God's uh, blessing on his life. And yet his desire wasn't to have position or authority or power. His desire was to minister, to preach the gospel. Our, we, we find tonight, before I, I start reading the chapter, I want to set the scene for all of us as Christians and as a church as a whole that our goal ought to be to be a minister, ought to be to serve. 
whether from the, the pastor to the deacons to the church members to the usher to the uh, choir to the nursery to uh, the teenagers to the adults to moms and to everybody that we would serve and love people. Every minister, excuse me, every member should be a minister. Good statement for a church. Every member ought to be a minister. If we want to effectively minister both in two fronts as a church, we minister to the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving power, the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And then we minister to the saved, to the redeemed, with the edifying power of the gospel, the, re the remainder of the scriptures. We see that salvation, the gospel, is not just the fact that we can have our sins forgiven. The gospel message is that we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, may we not view salvation so cheaply as to think all it is is a change of our eternal destination. I understand when people talk about salvation is, is the idea that, well, I get to live in heaven forever. Or I've got my, uh, you know, my eternity settled. And that's good. That's not all that salvation is. It's more than that. And if all we view is, uh, well, I'm going to live with Jesus forever. That's why I got saved. We're missing the joy of salvation. We're missing. Uh, you talk about restore unto me the joy of my... How can we be joyful on this earth if the only reason we got saved is for heaven? Oh, the reason we got saved isn't just for heaven. The reason we got saved is for a relationship with Jesus Christ so we can enjoy that on this earth. So the ministry of the church is twofold. One, it's the ministry of reconciliation. We'll find that later in 1 Corinthians. The ministry of reconciliation, bringing sinners to Christ and reconciling them uh, with the Lord. Then it's the ministry of edification, the ministry of of building the saints of God, the believers in their faith, grounding in doctrine and in discipleship, and there we can draw closer to the Lord. It's one thing to come to God. It's a whole other thing to continue to grow with God. And that's the ministry that God has given the church, both here in Corinth from thousands of years ago to today at Crossroads Baptist Church in 2022. We have the ministry but if we want to be faithful in executing this ministry we know that it's going to cost someone something unless we get nervous tonight i'm not talking about dollars and cents and giving of monies and such the offerings already been taken but the cost that we're to pay often deals much greater than just our wallets i'll ask this question what did it cost someone to reach you with the gospel. And what did it cost someone for you to continue to grow in Jesus Christ? I asked myself that question, and I could go back to uh, 1990, a few years ago, as a young, uh, young boy in first grade, 1989 maybe it was, 1990. Um, down the streets of Northern California, and as a man came and invited me to church for the very first time. And he showed up on a Saturday, he came back the next Saturday, came back Sunday, picked us up, came back the next week, came back again, and again, and again. And it wasn't a, uh, a coming back just for the sake of, uh, hey, come, come with me to church. He came back to make sure my family was okay. He came back to help a single mom who was raising three kids. He came back with uh, information about a Christian school. He came back with opportunities to get involved in children's programs on Sunday night and Wednesday nights. And I'm reminded that it cost somebody for me to get to church. Their time, their abilities. I could take you to events gone by in our childhood not just a ride to church or the gas money or the time to fit into someone else's car to get to church. And I could take you to times where certain gifts were given to a, a family, again, that single mom doing the best she could and 
certain things were given in, in uh, honor and recognition to try to help kids that uh, were without in some respects. Sacrifices were made. Some were physical, some were tangible, some were intangible. I know that as I began to grow and mature, certain sacrifices were made for me to continue growing in Christ, even after salvation. For many years, I'd go to camp every year and youth conference as a teenager, and these events had a cost and a payment. And the goal was to raise the money for each event every year. And we would have different fundraisers or work events that teenagers and young people could earn money. I believe in that, the value of work to get uh, what you want. But I can remember many times where someone would help me selling car wash tickets to go to camp. We'd sell them for a dollar. And uh, on, the, on the, the back of the car wash ticket in small print was the date and time and location of where the car wash was to be held. And uh, we'd sell them weeks in advance. You know, when you buy a car wash ticket for a dollar and then come get your car wash, the idea was we'd sell thousands of them and wash dozens of cars. <laughs> As many people would give us the dollar and maybe not uh, come through or they'd forget about it. But I remember many people who would want to try to help a young person raising money for a Christian camp or a youth conference and, hey, here's $20, give me just one ticket, or selling a candy bar or something of that nature. Hey, here's $5 and you keep the candy. I like those ones. <laughs> but a cost was, was made. Again, we can look at the physical investment, but I'm convinced that effective ministers and servants do more than just pay with their money. For some, the call of ministry is vocational. In other words, it's, it's a livelihood. Now, it's not most, but it is some. What Paul's going to write to us here in 1 Corinthians 9, he's writing from the position as a vocational minister. This was his, this was his job, not just a calling. This was, this was everything. In a local church, that might be a pastor and some places there's assistants and so forth and full-time ministers and thank the Lord for them. But in most churches, the bulk of people are not vocational, but they're voluntary. The calling is no less significant and no less real. In fact, the work of the volunteer usually dwarfs the work of the vocational uh, minister. Because usually the body does more than the single, single member. And as we read through 1 Corinthians 9, I want us to keep in mind that ministry is going to cost something. Let's look at the first couple of verses here as we set the scene at this church in Corinth. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. The first couple of verses here we find in the cost of the ministry that Paul writes about the ministry authority. He's, he's starting this chapter, and of course it's all one letter, but he's starting this section of his letter with the authenticity of his apostleship. He's reminding this church at Corinth, I was with you for 18 months, remember, as starting it and on his missionary journey. And now he's writing to them and trying to edify them and trying to serve them again. And they've written to him, he's writing back, and this is a correspondence epistle. And this is where Paul reminds the church, he says, I, I'm an apostle, I've got a position, I've got a status. It gives him credibility and authority concerning doctrine and practice. But in verse 2, he gets pretty personal as he says, If I be not an apostle unto others, in other words, maybe the church at Ephesus or Galatia or Thessalonica or Rome or these other churches, maybe they don't view me as an apostle, but yea, doubtless, I am to you. And this is the position, not as uh, 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 lording over the church, but he's reminding these people at Corinth, I've been with you. 
I labored for you. I preached for you. I put my hand to the plow with you. I've invested in you. Something very special about Paul's relationship with this church at Corinth. And by the way, all of us could probably relate to someone in our lives who was as such the Apostle Paul. Someone who's invested in us. Maybe it's a preacher. Maybe it's a, uh, a church member. Maybe it's a, uh, a parent. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a dear Christian uh, saint of God who uh, didn't have much uh, physical possession but imparted the words of God in your life. That's what Paul's reminding the church. It costs something. I was with you. I have the authority now to help you as an apostle. Verse number three. We come to now as he continues in his letter about this ministry liberty. The fact that he starts with some authority, but now he's expressing his liberty in the ministry. Verse number three. My answer to them that do examine me is this. In other words, there were some in the church and around that, that didn't believe Paul to be an apostle. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't view his, his words or his ministry with any value or significance. And he goes on to say, my answer to this, verse 4. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as uh, other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. In other words, verses 3 and 4, we, we have, we, we could eat and drink what we will. and We could have a wife and we could have uh, sisters and we could have people that we bring with us and we could we could have a family we could bring in just like other apostles Peter did Cephas did but Paul's reminding the church I didn't come with the 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 usury if you will of a family or of of, of a wife or someone to follow me along verse number six or I only in Barnabas have not we power to forbear working in other words, don't we, don't we have the ability, don't we have the liberty to go get a job? <laughs> can't, we, can't we work ourselves? Can't we make money doing something else? By the way, Paul, not only was he an apostle, what was his vocation? He was a tent maker. And certainly, if anyone could have made money, I don't think tent making was the most uh, monetarily significant job that Paul could have done. He was a well-educated man, but he did something for the craft for the purpose of, of bringing in some income. We'll find out why in just a moment. But he, he's reminding the church, we, we could be just like anyone else, marrying and, and families and sisters, and, and we could work, we could make money. Verse number seven, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charge? <laughs> this is the question now, some hypothetical questions. In other words, who goes out to war just because they want to? Don't soldiers go because they're told to go? And when they go, don't they get compensated for going? If you were going to be in the army or the, the military endeavors, whether back in the days of Rome or in our current state today, don't you go to war because you're told to? And if you're told to go, don't they, don't they care for you? Don't they pay for your needs? Continuing on in verse 7, Who goeth a warfare any time at, at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Verse 7 is reminding us, as Paul says, aren't there natural benefits to other men's labors? They go to war, they get paid. They go out and plant a vineyard, they get a crop. They go care for flocks, they get uh, goods and, and services from those flocks. And then he says in eight, verse 8, I'm not saying it just as a man, but the law says it. Follow on in verse number uh, 9. For it is written, this is, is in the law, in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for the oxen? Or saith he all, it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth 
should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the holy things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Here's the liberty that Paul is, is expressing to the church. And we'll, we'll put this in context now. Paul is writing to Corinth and he's, he's saying it is worthy of the minister, it is worthy of the apostle, it is worthy of those who feed you spiritually to receive of their labor. He says, uh, you don't go to war unless you're getting paid. You don't go uh, take care of the flocks unless you get compensation. You're not taking care of the vineyards unless you're uh, uh, paid for it. And he says, much more the spiritual things that we take care of, aren't we worthy of the carnal things at your hand, of your monies and Paul's expressing, Corinth, it, it, it's worth paying the minister. Now, please don't, don't, don't misunderstand the message tonight. We're not talking about paying uh, great sums of money or looking for uh, compensation for the, the, the ministers of God. But he's setting the scene here at Corinth with the idea, as a minister, we're worthy of a reward. Now, he says in verse number uh, 13, or excuse me, verse number, uh, verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? In other words, if other people can come in and uh, uh, feed you spiritually, aren't we worthy of that as well? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. What power? The power to receive benefits at your hand. We've not used this power, but suffer all things that we should, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. This is the reason that Paul chose the profession as a tent maker. He wasn't going to receive anything at the hand of the church at Corinth. Now, some churches did give to him, but many of them he did not want anything. He said, I'm not here to be bought. I'm not here to, to receive the gift, though we're worthy of it. Though allowed it, though nothing wrong with it, it wasn't for him to receive. Why? Lest it should hinder the ministry of the gospel. Paul recognized that this particular church at Corinth had an issue with trying to follow men rather than God. We've seen that earlier in the book. Remember how some were already uh, enamored with following Paul and some Peter and some uh, 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 Apollos and and. Uh, they, they had different affinities, and should they have given then monetary value or given money to Paul, it would have only endeared their heart more to him rather than the Lord. Paul, knowing this, said, I'm not receiving what's due to me. I'm not receiving the power, the liberty I have. If I wanted to bring in a wife or if I had a family, certainly they'd be worthy of taking care of. Certainly you'd want to uh, 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 pick up the expense of of caring for the family and the men of God. But Paul says, I'm not doing that for the purpose of the gospel. Now he's building on this here. We want to come to the, the thrust of the chapter as we continue. We look at the ministry reward. So if Paul got into the ministry, he went to Corinth, not for what was due him in the right of, of usury or the right of being taken care of, of course, he could take a salary. He could be afforded uh, the, the provision that Corinth could have offered him. But what was his reward? Why would Paul spend 18 months in Corinth? And why would he write to them again? And why would he serve as an apostle? What was the reward? What was in it for Paul? And likewise, what's in it for ministers today? Well, let's look here at verse number 15. But I have used none of these things. In other words, I've not used any money. I've not used what's due to me. 
Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. In other words, I'm not writing to you so that you feel sorry and begin to pay. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is upon me, or is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, verse 18, what is my reward? Uh, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Here's the ministry reward. As Paul laid aside his right to compensation willingly, he didn't charge them what he could have. He didn't write to them in order to collect a past due debt. He didn't require maintenance for himself. He didn't bring in a wife or a family in order to receive uh, benefits on their behalf or need of accommodations. He went to Corinth as a minister. And his reward, as clearly stated, was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. His joy, his reward came from the service of God, not the payment from men. In fact, we read it here in verse number 16, or the end of verse 15. Uh, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. In other words, don't pay me with your money. Don't give me your compensations to take away my glory. The fact that I get to do this for the Lord. Paul said, I don't want it to be said. I'm preaching. I'm coming to the church. I'm ministering for the sake of, uh, of, of dollars, of payment, of someone taking care of me. Verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He says, I have to do this. It's a divine calling. It's a passion. It's a joy. It's the filling. It's willing, hearty service to the Lord that bears reward. And may I turn this now to all of us as a church and recognize the benefit, the, the, the reward of ministry. Is it going to cost something? Absolutely, it costs something. Someone's going to bear the burden. Someone's going to invest the time. Someone's going to pay the price. But what is the reward? The reward is knowing that God is pleased. The reward is knowing, as Paul proved to himself in self-denial of what was afforded to him, that he would preach the gospel without charge. He'd be faithful to his calling. That was his reward. Knowing that God would take care of him. And not that he'd be dependent upon the things of man. But here's, as we, we move deeper into the chapter, this last two sections, we find the whole theme of the chapter wrapped up in this. Here's the ministry toll. The toll of the ministry. What, what comes down to, what did Paul have to pay, if you will? What was the cost? Verse number 19, while he did not collect from the hands of the Corinthians... Here's what he invested. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. In other words, Paul says, I was born a free citizen. Now back in these days, uh, people who were born in free, uh, free citizenship of Rome, it meant you were at a higher position. You weren't born into slavery or born into debt or born into need. Paul had a position in his, in his life as a good place. He was a free citizen, owed nobody anything. But here's what he says. Even though I'm free, verse number 19, I made myself servant unto all that I might gain, more, gain the more. I'll live as a servant so that I could reach more people. I have freedom, but I'm going to live as though I'm bound. Verse number 20. None of the Jews I became as a Jew, 
that I may gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. While Paul was an apostle and a missionary to the Gentiles, when he would preach to the Jews, the Bible says he became as, a, as the Jews. Of course, he was. But when Paul was saved, he left the Pharisees, he left the Sanhedrin court, he left the, the astute, learned position that he had as a Jew so that he could go preach to the unknown, uh, to, to the, the uh, barbaric world of the day. But he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew. Those that were under the law, I put myself under the law. Now, salvation, when grace comes and God saves the soul, we're free from the law. No more was the law having uh, power over Paul, but he said, I'm not, when, when ministering to the Jews, I'll put myself back under the law so that I could reach the Jews. Of course, they had quarrels over keeping the Sabbath and, and uh, some of the traditions and customs, and, and Paul says, well, if that's what it's going to take for me to reach them, I'll do that. There's nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't necessary. Isn't it amazing that as a true servant, the cost of ministry sometimes is putting ourselves in a position that we don't have to do? Paul didn't have to keep the law, but he did so that he could reach the Jews. He didn't have to put himself with the, the ceremonies, but he did so he could reach the Jews. He made himself as a servant so that he could reach the weak. We continue on in verse number, uh, verse number 21. To them they're without law. In other words, the Gentiles, they don't have the law of Moses. As without law, being not without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, or, or under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. So to the Jews, I'll put myself under the law. To the Gentiles, I'll live without the law. They don't understand it. Why try to live it? It's not necessary anyway. This isn't a double standard of Christianity as though Paul says, I'll just blend into society. No. He said, I'm going to become what's necessary of me so I can minister to others. If you need me to be loud, I'll be loud. If you need me to be soft, I'll be soft. If you need me to be with the law and dignified, I'll be with the law. If you want me without the law, I'll be without the law. All of these things so that he could reach others with the gospel. We continue in verse number 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Why does he do that? Verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. You see, Paul gave up some of his personal liberties in order to benefit others. As a free citizen, he became a servant. As a Jew freed from the law, he put himself under the law. To the pagans without the law, he separated from the law to show them Christ. Oh, he didn't live lawless against the scriptures, but he lived without the customs to show Christ can be one without the law. He became what was needed by others so he could reach them with the gospel. We know that the ministry often may require a toll from us. You know, sometimes in order to reach children, you know what we need to do? Become like children. And to reach the uh, adults, what we need to do is put ourselves in adult mode. And to reach the needy and the poor and the outcast, you know what we need to do is put ourselves in the position of, of weakness and, and less stuff. And to reach those educated, what we must do is find ourselves educated. To reach those who are, are hurting and those who are uh, recovering from addictions, what we need to do is we don't go get on drugs to reach them, but we come off the high horse of, uh, uh, of uh, making ourselves as though, well, I can't, I can't, I can't relate to them. In Christ, the, the message, the, the, the ministry requires a cost. It's going to require us to become what others are in need of to give them the gospel. We find as we close out 
the, the chapter here, the ministry requirements. We know it's going to cost something, but here's the requirements in verses 24 through 27, a very familiar text. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body that I, and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's writing now to this church at Corinth in a, an analogy that they very well understood as he's writing in comparison to the athletes and the, the wrestlers and the gladiators of the day. He writes about a race. He says, don't you know that they which run in a race run all so that one can get a prize? There might be 10 runners. There might be 50 runners. There might be 100, but only one gets to win. Aren't you glad in Christ that you can run your race and I can run my race and both win. We're not in competition one with another. What we're in competition with is our race. So here's the analogy. They're running for an incorruptible crown. We as servants, as ministers of God, we are, we are running, we are striving for an incorruptible. So run your race. Paul's reminding this church, his race as an apostle was to uh, go places and do things that their race did not take them. But their race, nonetheless, was just as important in the city of Corinth. And likewise, here in a local church, oh, our races may look different. Some may have the 100-yard dash. Some may have the 400K marathon. Some may have uh, a long stretch. Some may be in, in team sprints. A different look for all of us, but... The same goal, run that you may obtain the prize. God has something for us to do. And we find as he's reminding this church that we're ministers, we're called to do something. And while an athlete back in these days would work for their craft, the Bible says that they're temperate in all things. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate. In other words, would, would temper the body, would, would limit the body in all things so that he could better run his race or fight in his fight. The athlete of the day would, would change his diet, would uh, uh, exercise physically, would give up certain pleasures, would, would regimen the body in sleep and, in, and nutrition in order to best function in his venue. And likewise, for the Christian, here's our calling. There are some things we ought to limit to best serve our master, to best fight our fight, to best run our race. We ought to learn to change our appetites a little bit. To the shy, often need to learn to become bold. To the brash, we need to learn to become gentle. To the lazy, we need to learn to become zealous. To the content, we need to learn to become burdened. In other words, just because we have one appetite, oh, if we're going to strive for the masteries, we better be temperate in all things. Learn to cast away the sin that does so easily beset us as we read in Hebrews. We know that we have a chief adversary in this war. As we conclude the chapter there in verse number 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. In other words, the runners in a race, they don't know who's going to win, uncertainly. Oh, but we know as a Christian, we don't run uncertainly. We know that if we finish the race, we win. So fight I, speaking of the, the wrestler, the, the, the gladiator, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. That's the idea of shadow boxing or training. I, I, I'm just punching the air. I'm, I'm wrestling just to practice. In the Christian life, there's no practice. Ephesians tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and, and spiritual wickedness and high places and rulers of darkness. We're in a real fight, not, not just beating the air. It's, there's no time to practice. We're engaged in the fight. 
here's the enemy, but I keep, verse 27, under my body and bring it into subjection. The biggest enemy we have in the fight, in the race, in the uh, uh, skirmish as a minister is our own body. What keeps us from being most effective in the race, what keeps us from being most effective in the fight, what keeps us from being most effective in the church, it's our own self. It's the body. This is why Paul says, I keep it under subjection. I deny it the things that it wants. I, I contend with the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Because the duty of the minister isn't just to lead others. It's to lead self. The last phrase in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, when I've ministered to everyone else, I myself should be a castaway. It's not fitting for the minister to save the world and lose his own soul. To try to throw out the lifeline and yet drown himself. In other words, may we be reminded tonight in this fight, in this race, in this war, lest I should be a castaway. I can't lead others to righteousness and fall in the sea of unrighteousness. There's no nobility in trying to save others while drowning at sea ourselves. I must keep my body under subjection. It does us no good to try to serve others and neglect our own spiritual well-being. Oh, may it not be said that the church, at, whether in Corinth or here in, in Wanata, let's not be the idea of a minister that says we're here to help everyone else, but we ourselves don't need the grace of God. We don't need to contend for the faith. We don't need to follow the rules. We don't need to keep our own body under subjection. That leads to a group of hypocrites. That leads to is the word cast away. Trying to tell you how to be saved, trying to tell you how to live for God, trying to tell you how to have a relationship with Christ, but myself, I don't need it. Paul says, let's avoid that. Let's avoid being the cast away. It's good for you, but not good for me. It's the wrong mentality. As we conclude the whole message tonight, we find the cost of ministry. We know that it's worth a price. Paul was worthy of, of a, a, a payment, of, of uh, recompense. He said, I, I, I'm putting it away. I don't need it. I don't require it. Why? For the furtherance of the gospel. And in so doing, in furthering the gospel and ministering to others, may we remember the toll is we need to change what we are to help others. To the weak, I become weak. To the Jew, I'll become the Jew. To the lost, I'll become, or, or to the, the, the uh, uh, Gentile, I'll become out of the law. Uh, to the uh, poor, I'll make myself poor. To the educated, I'll be educated. To whatever the need is to give the gospel, may that be the price we're willing to pay. And then the zealous nature behind it, running in the race, fighting the fight, let's do it with all we have knowing that we'll receive an incorruptible crown, the prize of God. This is the cost of ministry from 1 Corinthians 8. Can we pray tonight, 1 Corinthians 9? Let's pray as we seek the Lord this evening, as we wrap up our service and conclude the day in the house of God. Let's consider as a church here what it is that we're called to do, called to minister, to serve, to spread the gospel. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you now for your word and the message we've heard this evening. I pray you'd help us to take heed to your, uh, to your word and, and draw closer to yourself. The music will play this evening on Sunday night. Let's conclude our service with the thoughts that were mentioned this evening, as well as throughout the day, as well as the start of a new week. We examine ourselves and make sure we step into Monday completely right with the Lord. Completely ready to serve Him the best we can. We sang the song to throw out the lifeline. Let the lower lights be burning. Let's 
we leave this place, that is our commission. We heard in Sunday school, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to spread the gospel. As we're ministers of the gospel, as we're ministers of the nature that Christ has given us, can we be found evangelizing the lost, edifying the saints, examining ourselves, running with patience the race that's set before us, lest we should be a castaway? Can we take diligent heed to the church family that God has given us? Love one another, pray one for another. One more stanza we'll play, and as we continue our prayer time, may the Lord lay someone on our heart even right now. Perhaps someone that needs the gospel, someone who needs to be saved, someone who's away from the Lord. This would be a great week to extend out and reach to them, pray for them, love them. Would God give you the name of somebody that you could encourage and be a blessing to? If ever we love you, oh Lord, my Jesus, tis now. Our Father, this evening, I thank you again for loving us, and I thank you for giving us a church. Lord, for what's been accomplished in this place throughout our day and our Sunday school hour, the morning service this evening, well, we thank you for it. I thank you for a faithful church. I thank you for people who love you supremely. And Lord, as we go our ways this week, I pray that we would stay in safety, that we would walk in your will. Lord, I pray that your will would uh, shine through us, that we would have the mind of Christ, the eyes of Christ this week, the love of Christ, may it come through us. And Lord, help us to draw nigh to you day by day. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory that you so richly deserve for it. We pray now in Jesus' name.